I know testimonies that make you just cry of husband and wife stuff. And I'm just going to tell you a little one, little one. See, I believe that I believe that love isn't something where God says, I love you. Do you love me? That's not God's love, see? That's selfishness. I don't love you because you love me. I just love you because it's who I am. See, Christian love is supposed to be completely different than the world. The world's love, phileo love and agape love, they're just totally different. And I don't even want to go into the definitions of the words. But what I want to tell you is that we spend a lot of time talking about the intimacy and the secret place and what we want in the secret place. And a lot of people go in there for the wrong reasons. See, a lot of people go into the secret place because we want the power of God to be manifest in our life. <laughs> Serious. Because we want, because yes, we want to know Him intimately. But what does that mean to know God intimately? To know God intimately means that we become like Him. To know God intimately means that the characteristics and attributes of God come and take part and, and make us what they look like. In other words, the character, the divine nature of God comes in, dispossesses the carnal nature so that you can become what the divine nature looks like. What the divine nature acts like, what the divine nature talks like. Yeah. See, righteousness is an amazing thing. Righteousness, the only one that has the right to take the righteousness off of you is you. Because Satan cannot do it. He does, don't you give him that much authority and power. He does not have the ability to declothe you. You are the only one. See, redemption means that I'm brought back to the original place that I was in before I ever ate the tree. So in God's eyes, God sees Todd as if he's never eaten the tree. Redemption and righteousness means that I'm clothed with God. Therefore, put on Christ. Put on Jesus. I've been clothed with His nature. The divine nature and the carnal nature have nothing to do with each other, man. Nothing. So when I go into that secret place, I want to become like my daddy. And my daddy is love. And he made me in the image of love in the beginning. So when God created man, he created man in his own image. And he created us in the image of love. So when I go into the secret place, I am crying out to my father so that I can become like him. Dad, I want to be just like you. I don't want to learn how to love people. I want to become what love looks like. I want to become what love acts like. I want to become what love talks like. I want to become what love walks like. I want to be so unoffendable. You do not have the right to offend me. I am so serious and so confident in that. Why? Because this thing's been tested, man. I am only five years old in the Lord. I was an atheist, drug addict, hardcore rebellion, the whole nine yards, man. And Jesus woke me up. Woke me up back in October of 2004. I had no biblical nothing, no background, no understanding at all. The only background that I had is that I didn't like Christians because most of them I saw were hypocrites. I never saw Christ in somebody, so I never wanted what they had to offer me. I had a lot of people that told me what I wasn't, but never would someone come and tell me how much I'm loved and pull the gold out of what the world says was trash. Come on! Doesn't take a man or woman of God to point the bad stuff out. The world can do that, and they're good at it. But it takes a man or woman of God to pull the gold out of what the world says is no good. We are gold seekers, man. I love the gold dust, but I love pulling the gold out of people. Oh, this thing's amazing. Man, there was this guy, and, and he was married to his wife. They were married for, I believe, 13 years, and they had three kids. And one day, the wife got a little unhappy in her relationship. This is true stuff. This is a testimony unto marriage. And she got a little unhappy. She wasn't treated like she believed that her man should treat her. So she got on the internet. So she met somebody on the internet and she up and left. All three kids and the husband after 13 years. And she said, see you later. Didn't, actually didn't say anything. Just packed her stuff and left. So she's gone. The husband is freaking out. Like, 
really mad. Mad at God, because Satan does this crafty thing, see? What he does is he's not just the accuser of the brethren before God, but he's the accuser of God before the brethren. See, Satan will sneak in, bite somebody, blame God. God will take the rap. A good and loving God will take the rap for something that God never did to begin with because we don't understand the definition of the devil is steal, kill, and destroy, and God's not that one. So a lot of times, God takes the rap because we think God's in control. Whatever will be, will be, brother. Come on, God's sovereign. If he wants to, he will. It's a twisted theology out there, man. If God was in control, how would you have the power of life and death in your tongue? You couldn't speak death. You'd have no ability to. Why? Because God would control your tongue. Yeah. This is very important. We have to get this thing because not everything that happens is the will of God. But a lot of times we think everything's the will of God. Look, if God's in control, then why would you need to pray? Because what's going to happen, it's going to happen anyway. Why pray? Why have faith? God's doing it. Just let it go. That's where a lot of the state of the church is in right now. Well, God's in control, brother, you know. People preach twisted sermons at a funeral. Because a, a child gets killed in an accident and says, well, God needed your child. He needed another angel. I hate that stuff, man. It's not the gospel. God received that child but didn't kill him. So now you have people that like might be able to be okay with it for that time period. Because, well, you know, God's sovereign. He's a good God. And then all of a sudden, 10 years down the road, they're bitter, angry, and mad because since Satan got away with that one, he takes all that he can get. And before you know it, there are 20,000 things that God did because he's in control. And somebody preached from a pulpit out of their personal experience at the cost of what the word of God says and damaged somebody's life. Come on, this is the real deal. I see it everywhere I go. If you get mad with what I'm saying, guard your heart and stay for the whole thing. I'm serious, man. I'm not, I'm not preaching something contrary to this book. I'm telling you the truth. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus came to give us life and that we may have it more abundantly. We have to understand death, loss, and destruction, hand of hell. Life and life more abundantly. Abundance is life from God. And that word abundant means violently excessive life. Violently excessive. That's what Jesus came to bring us. So if you can't put it in violently excessive life and abundant life, it's not God. We've got to be really careful because, man, Satan is the, he's the official accuser. He'll accuse God, get you to put the rap on God, and then all of a sudden you've got an attitude against God. And some people even think that one day when they get to heaven, they think they're going to take this up with God. I don't think so. <laughs> if you're fortunate and you're there, because narrow is the way. Strive to enter the narrow gate. And you're laying before God in a puddle of mess for a million years? I don't think you're going to be copping an attitude. You're going to be real thankful that you're there. And you're going to be too happy to think of any of that twisted stuff. It's a good word. Yeah. <laughs> it is. You guys all right? Yeah. Okay. I will take you on a roller coaster while I'm here. But I'll preach truth and I promise you I'll never lie to you. You'll never hear anything twisted come out of my mouth. The only thing I know is what he's taught me. See, I know what it's like to lie. I was a professional liar. I partnered with the father of lies my whole life. And when Jesus woke me up, I've never spoken a lie. Not once, not ever. This is very important, guys. Why? I don't care how little you think it is. A lie is a lie. And not having an understanding about it and speaking something... That's different. But having an understanding and going blatantly against it to try to be okay, to try to keep someone comfortable. You have a comforter. You're supposed to be uncomfortable. So speak the truth in love. If you love somebody, you'll speak truth into their life and you won't hold back. Right. Holding back is, is wrong. And you keep people bound up in trash. Let it go. Let God do it. He's better at it than we are. Right? Okay. So this lady left... 
The husband's freaking out, totally mad, totally, why? Like for three days, screaming. So on the third day, the husband hears this voice. Harry. So he's like, what? What? Harry, you don't have a problem. And Harry freaked out. What do you mean I don't have a problem? My wife, 13 years, has left me. She's in the arms of another man. The children have lost their mother. And you tell me that I don't have a problem. He's screaming at God. God said, Harry, your wife's in trouble. We don't even think that way. So immediately he weeps, he breaks down, he starts to intercede for his wife. Tells the kids, I was wrong, kids, for thinking the way I was. It was all about me. This is all about your mama, she's in trouble. We need to pray for mommy. So they went into prayer for a year. She didn't come home for a year. One day she comes home. After 12 months of praying, fasting, Crying out to God, mercy, mercy. She comes home, she comes to the door. She says, honey, she said, I'm sorry. He opens the door. You know what his first thing is? I'm so glad you're back. It's like you never left, come in. She said, there's more. She said, I'm pregnant. He said, that's okay. I'll love this baby just like it's mine. Because God has made me understand what it means to become love. Your children have been missing you. Come in. They're married today with another child that the father of that child never showed up again in the life. Doesn't matter because he's dad to that child. I, there are so many testimonies like that one on marriage. Dude, that's like supernatural. (laughs) See, when 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 you and I'm not even here to preach on marriage. I'm just when they came up, I just cry because I love I love that. I see it all the time. I love speaking into someone's life and watching God go and doing it. And and it might be a couple days till it happens, but when it happens, boom, everything's like it's just there. You can't stop it. It's so good. Yay. (laughs) Yay. Yay. God's good. He's amazing. I just came from uh, Kauai. I was down there. It's really warm. (laughs) But I, I was actually out in California. I was out... The week before that, um, I was at Woodland, and then I flew to California. And then all the planes going back to Pennsylvania were stopped because of all the snow. We got pounded with snow. And so I couldn't get home to see my babies. I got to go and speak at the the Bethel School to the first-year students. And Chris Overstreet is a really good buddy of mine, and I love him, the outreach pastor from there. And just had a great time, fellowship and stuff. and, And... I was going to fly home on Friday and my plane got delayed till Sunday. And so I couldn't get home till Sunday. So I called the guy in Kauai and I said, hey man, I said, I'm only going to be able to go home and be with my family for one day. I've been gone for like nine days. And I, I like to make sure that I, I have a three-year-old, a 13-year-old and an amazing wife. And they're my best buddies. And they said something powerful and they said, we don't know what ministry do you understand if they would have gotten a ministry in the, the way that they were in their marriage, it would have been wrecked? Do you understand that foundational stuff is establishing right, righteousness in someone's life, righteousness in the marriage, and all of a sudden it's so solid? Don't just press to get into ministry. Be very careful and guard your heart and get into Him so that when He sees fit and it's time, He'll put you right in, man. But when you put yourself in, you have to fight to stay there. But when God puts you in, you'll be all right. Because He'll have you. There's so much for press to get into ministry today. And like, get me out of my job. My, my workers, none of my people that I work with are Christians. Knock it off. You're to be the light, man. 
Work hard where you're at. Don't press to get into ministry. Press and allow your job to be your mission field. I'm serious, man. Do your job as under the Lord and then wreck your workplace in love. Uh, don't get upset at me right now about talking about ministry stuff. I'm guarding your heart. I'm protecting you. Because there's lots of people that get mad because it didn't work. And then, yeah, I tried that. And then they're mad at God because their ministry didn't work out because they put themselves in there. Your life is one big ministry. Everywhere you go, you're a conduit for the glory of God to flow through. Every second of every day. And when God says, hey, listen, I see that this can go here. He'll say, he'll put it, you won't be able to stop it. It'll just come and and it'll overtake you. The goodness of God, it'll just overtake you. And he'll put you in there. But be careful and guard your heart about trying to put yourself into something before God says that you're ready for that. He'll tell you. He'll say, you're ready. Come on, do it. So what happened in my life. I didn't try to get into ministry. I just, I love my job. I did. I loved it. All three of them. <laughs> I did. I'll probably talk about that a little bit here. I want to talk about the Kauai thing. So I called Keith, my buddy, and I said, dude, I said, I need to maybe like delay my trip coming down for a couple days because I'm not going to be home with my family because my family's important to me. See, family... Jesus comes first or you're no good for your family. But ministry comes after family or you're no good for your family. See, Jesus becomes everything and your family becomes everything. And you minister out of that place right there. Because then it's who you are, not what you do. This isn't about what I do. It's not about I have a big ministry. This is, this is my ministry. It's about this is my life. This is who God's made me to be. This is who He's created me to be. He's created me to, to be an amazing husband to my wife. I'm supposed to love my wife like Christ loved the church. That's a man of God. Who am I to say I'm a man of God and then allow my family to slip by the wayside? And then use some scriptures like, well, you're supposed to hate your family. I hear that. I hear that stuff. Well, you know, brother, it does say, you know, I didn't come to, you know, I came with a sword to divide. No, you love your, you love your wife like Christ loved the church and you be a father to your kids so your kids know what it's like to receive a father. It's good. (laughs) So we didn't come to hear this. Sorry. It's really good. It's awesome. So Keith, I told Keith, he goes, well, let me see what I can do, man, about backing up your flight or something. So I'm out there. In, in California and all of a sudden uh, my wife my wife texts me and says we're all going to Kauai with you it's crazy because we couldn't have done that you know we don't have finances to do that stuff so he flew all of us down there so we all went down they met me they went that way I went this way and we all it was amazing we had an amazing time God told me that I'm taking this island Has anybody ever been there where I'm talking about? Kauai? Kauai, right? We had the most amazing time. There are all kinds of like Buddhists and New Age people. God loves them. Oh, I have such fun with New Age people. I just do. They can see colors on you and stuff. They do. They look at you. Whoa, bro. I'm I'm so serious, man. You got amazing aura. You know what a lot of times? Nine out of ten new age people will tell me, it's blue. It's blue and there's some hints of gold. But it's blue. Whoa. I'm not making fun of it. They really see. I love it. Come on, man. I don't need to get them in a headlock to get them to pray my prayer. Listen, I'm all about souls. I'm all about that because that's why we're here. We're here to love people into the kingdom. I'm not here to go out there to get them to pray my prayer, go for their juggler vein so they can get their names written in some book. Be very careful and hear me correctly. See, in evangelical zeal, people have gone out there to try to go for the juggler vein to manipulate somebody into position to pray your prayer. And neglected love altogether. So it's become about my motive. And my motive is, you're going to pray my prayer. And I know how to get you into that position. I'm being serious. Is anybody following me? 
This is really important. I, please don't hear me wrong. I'm all about bringing people into the kingdom. I see it happen all the time. Why? Because I want to become loved so people want what I have. Not because I can talk a good talk, but because I can walk a good walk. So that my life is what it looks like for a man that believes to walk out what he truly believes, to become the Word. See, Jesus was the Word made flesh. God wants our word, our flesh to become the Word. Are we not to be a living epistle known and read by all men? Yes. So God wants your flesh to look so like the Word. <laughs> Is it possible? Jesus was the Word made flesh, correct? Okay. Do you all say that you abide in Him? Okay. Then you also ought walk just as He walked. It means you can walk just like Jesus walked. That means everywhere you go, miracles happen. It's not because of what you do. I'm not chasing signs. They follow me. They follow me. Why? Because I'm a believer. I don't pursue signs. They pursue me. Why? Because God flows in and through me. See, the key to this thing is that I didn't just pray a prayer. To go to heaven one day. I asked him to come into my life. Not just to have 80% of it. I submitted to God. I gave up. I've been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live. But the life I live, I live by faith in the one who gave himself for me. How do you overcome the enemy? Right. Watch. Watch. We overcome the enemy by the word of our testimony, by the blood of the Lamb, that we love not our own life unto death. That's the part that Satan hides from the church. He does, man, I can go to churches all over the world and people know the blood of the Lamb, word of the testimony, amen, praise God. It's the truth. There's songs that include just those two. But love not your own life unto death is the only way that you can even pick up your cross. Biblically, you cannot pick up your cross unless you denied yourself. Because if self is still in the way, you can't pick up the cross. See, it's not about you anymore. It's not about me. It's about Him. And I don't live for God. I live from Him. I live from my Papa to people. So, God's the Word, right? So like, He's never silent. He's always talking. He's the Word. You know when you go to sleep, you can actually pray like I pray it. In Job 30, 15, it says, In deep sleep when men slumber upon their beds, the Lord seals up the instructions from the day. Holy Spirit's up all night, right? So when I go to bed, I know the Holy Spirit's going to take the things that I was unable to even process during the day and seal them up at night and open my ears at night when I sleep. Because there's not enough time in the day to get it all in. But it's important that I get the Word in so that He has something to work with. This thing will change your life. But without Holy Spirit, it'll wreck others' lives. This Bible will change everything about you. If you try to do it in your own strength, it will change your head and not your heart. And then when you speak, you'll hurt people. Because yes, it'll be Scripture, but this thing's a sword. It wasn't Father, Son, and Holy Bible. It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. See, without Holy Spirit, you do things like think you can get away living a Romans 7 lifestyle and be okay with that. This stuff doesn't feel good when I talk about it. Why? Because people have been taught, well, you know, you're always going to be a sinner, brother. That's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. I was a sinner saved by grace, but in God's eyes, I've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into another kingdom, and it's light, 
And now I've become a saint in the eyes of the Father. Very, very, very powerful. Very Set you free from you, powerful. <laughs> the gospel sets me free from me. My own thoughts and my own feelings, my own emotional whatever. The, the gospel sets me free from me. See, God calls me a new creation. He said, all things become new. He didn't say some. God doesn't recycle. He makes new things. It's true. If there's one place that I live from, it's a brand new creation reality. See, I believe that there's nothing in my life that I had done before that exists today. And psychological... See, the problem is that psychology has grafted itself into the gospel and it's made it a psychological gospel. And this is not psychology, man. This is supernaturalology. I'm not against psychologists, but when you integrate psychology into the gospel, you're trying to put the way that seems right to a man and incorporate that into the gospel. Some of you are on page with me. Some of you are like... I see it everywhere I go. It's okay. Do you understand that I love you and there's nothing in this for me? Yeah. I love you. I just do. I want to see you be free. I don't want you to, I don't want you to be bound up to, 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 to limited teaching. I don't want you to be bound up to a teaching that limits you. There are no chains on God. Take them off of Him. There is no bondage in Christ, man. None. So sometimes we're bound up because of Teaching on, on theological doctrine at the expense of what the Word and the Spirit do. See, I believe you can be so in love with God, so at one and at peace with God, that when I speak, the Word becomes Spirit and life and pierce your innermost being. God speaks to the inner man. And then all of a sudden, your inner man, your spirit man becomes a giant. And your head has to get out of the way because your heart is in dominance. You guys all right? Ah. Mm. Oh, Lord, my God, you are. Oh, Lord, my God, you are awesome in this place. Holy Lord, you are good and your love endures forever. We just love you. We just welcome you, Holy Spirit. You're already here, but your train fills the temple, God. Just keep on coming. Papa, thank you. Like a freight train, you drive hell right out of our thinking. In Jesus' name. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like, that dude is crazy. I am. I'm in love with the man. Let me tell you, 
This is so good. I, we were we were done. A, you all right with me bouncing around? I always finish what I started, but I'm bouncing a little bit. I'm just being me. I'm being free. Okay. We were up at a we were at a conference in Massachusetts, and and we're doing a power and love conference. We get back. It's like two o'clock in the in the morning. We went out to eat after the conference and just hanging out, fellowshipping and stuff. We're in the elevator of this hotel that's really big. It's in Framingham, Massachusetts, and. There's a bar downstairs that just let out. And they fill the elevator with drunk people. And I'm in the back with my buddy Dan and Tom. And we're back in the back of the elevator. And it's packed with people, you know. And the door shuts. I love elevators. Because I just do. I love them, man. See, because I just... I got this thing going. See, it... Regardless if it's just me in the elevator with everybody else, I, one person in Christ is the majority. So it doesn't matter how many people are there. I, I really don't, I don't care about that stuff, man. Why? Because God loves them profusely. And if you really want to see where you're at when you get on an elevator, talk about Jesus as soon as the door shuts. <laughs> I'm serious, man. Because you know there's that uncomfortability. I love hospital elevators. I've been trapped in hospitals for hours because we went to visit one person. And then all of a sudden, like, we meet one more, one more, one more. And all of a sudden, we've been to different, all kinds of different rooms and left. And 19 people get healed and set free. And... <laughs> wow, elevators! Sometimes it happens. Sometimes it's profuse. But either way, it's fun. It is. So we're in the elevator and these people are in there. And I'm like, okay, guys. <sighs> I got to do it. I'm coming out of the closet. <laughs> and they're all drunk, you know. And my two buddies are standing beside me. Dan and Tom. And I said, this is the best place. This is as good a time as ever. And the people in the elevator are getting uncomfortable. <laughs> it's so good. I said, I'm in love with a man. <laughs> and my buddies are beside me going... It's so, f have fun with this thing, man. Have fun with Jesus. He, he's not uptight. He's not like, he doesn't get stressed out. It's not like God's like lacking confidence at any time ever. He wants us to agree with him and be like our daddy. He wants us to be confident. If you guys get done before I do, you can go. Just so you know. I won't be mad if I see you walk out. I might call you out. I'm just kidding. I won't. So they're like, the girl looks, turns around, she goes, all right, that's awesome. She gives me five. Her boyfriend like takes a step back. He's like, I'm cool with that, bro. I looked at him and I said, his name is Jesus and he loves you so much. And they're like, oh. It's so good. So we chased him down the hall, prayed for him. Girl's neck got healed. We had a great time. See, this thing is amazing. See, what we don't, we, I don't think we really believe that God's for us, or else we wouldn't be walking in fear so much. I really don't think we believe that. We think that we gotta feel some ushy gushy feeling to know that God's for us, and you're deceived if you think that way. It's not about your feelings. Satan will play with your feelings. See, I, here's a, here's a good one that people find hard to believe. 97% of my walk, I don't feel anything. No presence, no warmth in my hands, no tingly, no tingles. Like 3% of my whole walk, I feel. I've been rocked by God, don't get me wrong. I've been like, I've been laid out for a long, long time. I've been, I manifest tears a lot because I love people and compassion. You know what I feel? I feel God's heart for people. I feel his love for people. I know how much he loves them because I know how much he loves me. So I walk in the love of God on a constant basis. When you see videos and stuff, what you see is love. I love people. I'm not trying to, okay, God, who do you want me to pray for? Okay. I don't do that stuff. I think that's weird. <laughs> We've been taught that. You need to pray about who to pray for. Here's a good rule of thumb. If you can look at somebody and say, Jesus didn't pay a price for them, then walk by him. If you can look at somebody and say, well, Jesus didn't pay a price for that one, then don't pray for him. We make this thing too complicated. God loves everybody. 
We, we have this theological doctrine that like, well, you've got to be led to somebody. I think that's weird too. I do. We say, well, look at Jesus. I mean, he went to the five porches. He only prayed for the one. Everybody was sick. I mean, come on, man. Uh, pastors try to talk me out of this thing. Good luck. I'm not, you're, I'm way past that stuff, man. Why? I believe there's a time where someone will be on my heart and I'll go to that one. But I'm not going to miss a thousand until that one happens. See, that Jesus was at the pool, at the, at the five porches and prayed for the one and he got out of there. And we teach, well, Jesus only, I, people used to correct me all the time. Hey, man, you got to be really careful about who you pray for because you don't know what you're opening up. First of all, that's the devil right there. I don't have a fear of like who I'm going to pray. If I have a fear of what's in them getting on me, I might as well pack it up, dude. No devil has the right to slime what God's blessed. You better think this way. Because it's not getting brighter out there. What are you going to do when a witch comes up to you and says, I've been assigned to curse you? Let me tell you what I do. I've been assigned to hug you. I, 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 I promise you, I've been in so many situations like this, man. So many. Where they look at you like... Did God curse you or bless you? Is it possible to curse what God's blessed? Be very careful where your theology takes you. Because we teach this generational curse doctrine sometimes. And it's very, very, very twisted. It says that a generational curse can, can, can continue up to the third and fourth generation. It's true. But one righteous continues up to a thousand. So let's stop going after the curses and start going after the heart of God and loving people and realizing that His mercy trumps any of that stuff, man. See, what we don't need is another excuse why somebody didn't get made whole. Prayed for him and, well, you know, it might be a generational curse that we didn't address. I want you to look at the life of Jesus and look at how many He addressed. If He's supposed to be our model, now this messes with people, but don't be upset at me. It's in the gospel. It's the gospel. You all right? <laughs> Sometimes this upsets teachers. I'm, I love you. I'm not. I've, I've seen thousands of people that people have been told, oh, I, have a gener I have this and I have that and the reason why I'm not healed is because they told me this and that. And actually when you tell someone the reason why you didn't get healed is because of you, that's sin. I despise it and I think it's the doctrine of devils. You can't tell me one person Jesus prayed for that didn't get healed, first of all. And you can't tell me one person that Jesus prayed for or walked away from because, no, well, we can't deal with this one. No, because there's, the, oh, your ancestors messed up. I've got to go now. I, I'm a real simple guy. I look at his life and I'm supposed to walk like he walked. So I'm going to find out how he talked, what he did. I'm going to read the Gospels until my eyes fall out. I want to know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the book of Acts. And I spend the quality, most of my time in there. Why? Because I believe red letters are the supreme court of the Gospels, man. Are the supreme court of the Bible. I love the Bible. Don't get me wrong. I read the whole word. But I believe if you can't get it answered in the word, you go to the red letters and you'll get your answer. Does that make sense? Am I safe? I hope so. I hope Jesus' words are safe in this house. <laughs> If they're not, I gotta go. <laughs> oh my. We having fun? Yeah. Oh, it is fun. It's good. Um, so he prays for the, for the man at the five porches and he gets out of there. And I've had many a pastor and teachers and elders and, because when I, man, when I started praying, when I saw, when I came out of I was in Teen Challenge for two months, and sometime this weekend I'll probably go a little bit in my testimony and stuff, but I wasn't churched or schooled in church or none of that. I met Jesus in Teen Challenge, and I was only there for two months. I left the program ten months early.
Because I had an encounter with Jesus. So you can take it. You can take a theological doctrine from a man, but you can't take an experience away. You can't take an experience, a personal experience with God, an encounter from God. You can't take that away. See, that's why you're an encounter waiting to happen. See, because when you walk and God encounters somebody through you, they can't, that can't be taken away. You can't take that from them. Look, we were in a restaurant this morning, early, and I flew from Hawaii, so I was really out of it, man. I was tired. We went in there just getting some oatmeal and stuff, and John's not here, is he? I don't think he couldn't come tonight. Anyway, we go into this restaurant, and we get our food and stuff, and I start hearing some stuff about this waitress, and just about her heart and about some different things. And, and she's like, yeah, and, and her back was messed up, and her neck was messed up. She goes, are you psychic? I said, kind of. <laughs> so I prayed for her in Jesus' name, and just she got healed and stuff. And then I heard about a dilemma that she's been in for two and a half years. It's been a horrible ordeal. And God told me to sow a $100 tip to her. I'm not boasting in the amount of my tip. I'm telling you that you can hear from God. And be obedient, and it'll change someone's life. So she goes, you don't have to do that. I said, no, I don't have to. I get to. She's like, yeah, but you don't get it. I said, I do. Now you get it. Here. (laughs) And she lost it and had to run. Why? Because that seed came at the very time that she needed it because she didn't have groceries. She has kids to feed. And I just... If you're going to go and tell your waitresses and waiters about God, don't rip them off when you leave. Waitresses and waiters say their worst days are Sunday. The meanest people and the, and the, the cheapest people. It ought not be, man. We ought to be a radical blessing. You want to be blessed? Be a blessing. But I don't ever just sow into people because I want God to sow into me. I sow because it's who I am. I give because it's who I am. So she got wrecked. And we left and she said, I love you. I love you too. God bless you. God loves you so much. I know, I know. <laughs> She's trying to do her job. She's at another table. I was out with, uh, I was out with Chris. You know Danny Silk? Anybody know of him? Yeah. Amazing, man. I got to have lunch with Danny and Chris. We're at the Olive Garden. We're just hanging out, you know, and our waitress comes over. Danny's on the little earpiece phone thing, and he's sitting here. I'm sitting here, and Chris is sitting here, and Chris take me to, took me to, this, to the Olive Garden where he has his own plate. It's called the Chris, the Chris O plate. It's cool. It's all vegetables and stuff. He just goes there all the time. So we're just laughing about that. The waitress comes over, and I see, I see a dancer, and I said to her, I said, oh, my gosh. I said, you're a dancer. She goes, do you know me? I said, kind of. Because God lives in me. So I'm sharing with her about how God, uh, you know, about this is what God says. And blah, 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 blah. You've been dancing since you were four years old. And actually you get a real love from teaching others how to dance. And you've wanted to get a dance studio, but you haven't been able to do it. She goes, well, there's seven just in Reading. I said, yeah, but this one's for God. And I started to share with her about her heart. And she's like... This is so crazy. I got I to gotta go. I'll be back. <laughs> She's wrecked. And Danny's on the phone just laughing on the phone. He gets on the phone. He goes, you're wrecking, our, you're wrecking our waitress. I said, we're having fun with her. She's like, he's like, yeah, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. And we're just talking in fellowship. She comes back and I start hearing about her right ankle. I said, you, you, you twisted your right ankle really bad and it's never healed. She goes, what is going on? I said, give me your hand. So I prayed for her and her whole body gets, she goes, she starts tearing up and crying. She goes, I gotta go. She goes, I'll be back. So she goes and comes back. Serious. It's really good. That's how it happens. It is. When he said, uh, you know, do you want uh, to stay at a hotel? I, I want to stay with people. Because I love to hang out with people. I love people. But this thing is better caught than taught. Because this will get on you. It will possess you. Yeah. You're meant to be possessed by God. Yeah. You're meant to be fully possessed by God. You're meant to be a walking manifestation of what God is in a man or in a woman. You're you're meant to be a manifestation of His glory. See, Christ in you, the hope of glory, is the mystery revealed. But Christ coming out of you is that hope coming out of you. It's the manifestation of that hope. See, Christ in you is the hope of glory. 
but it's not supposed to stay there. As it comes out of you, it's the manifestation of hope revealed. <laughs> oh, it's good. So she comes back to the table again and she's like, I can't stop thinking about this. What is going on? And I started to share God's heart for her again. And she's like overwhelmed. Doesn't know what to do. And Chris is like, right on, man. Because Chris, if you've ever met Chris, he's a wild man. He's pretty awesome. We get along pretty well. And uh, our bill comes. And I told her, I said, I need you to do me a favor. Ring me up a, a separate bill. She goes, for what? I said, I don't know. Something maybe for a buck or something. So Chris goes, well, I want a cappuccino. I said, well, I'll just get yours, dude. And then she went away. And, and I said, Chris, I said, we've got to bless this girl. He goes, yeah, man. He goes, I didn't bring my wallet with me. I said, I'll, I'll bless her for you, too. So we'll do a thing. And... And Danny got the bill, so he's paying for all the food. So, like, God told me to, to give her 200 bucks on a cappuccino. <laughs> <laughs> so, we wrote it out, you know, and, and I folded it and I gave it to her and I said, God just loves you so much. She opened it up, she goes, ah! <laughs> I mean, she freaked out. The restaurant was packed with people, immediately snot and tears. She had the gift of snot. Anybody have that besides me? Sometimes, right? She's like, oh my God, what are you doing? Why would you do this? And everybody's like, oh my gosh, is everything okay? Manager's coming over. She's causing a scene. But it's the perfect setup for God to like love people. And she's like, you're welcome. And the manager goes, thank you. I said, God so loves this place. You guys are amazing. And they're like, Wow, thank you. She's going in, she went in the kitchen screaming. She came and hold, she's losing it, man. There are Bethel students that work at that restaurant that have been trying to get to that girl's heart and she's been locked and God unlocked her. But watch, it's not because I'm the harvester. I just watered seeds they already sown. See, I'm not the harvester. Neither are you. The pressure's off. All you are is a sower or a waterer. Yay, I don't have to go for the juggler vein and get them to pray my prayer. I just have to love them. And God will bring them right in. He's better at it than we are. Oh. So then she comes back to the table. And like Danny goes, you forgot the bill. And he gave it to her. And, ah! He blessed her socks off too, man. She got totally wrecked. It was so awesome, right? That's the way it's supposed to go. Come on, man. We need to become love. Sometimes you're going to give out of what you don't even have. I could tell you about our life and my wife and where we are financially. And you got, it doesn't even make sense. doesn't. You guys all right? You okay? I'm telling you testimonies, but it's kingdom. I'm telling you kingdom principles. I'm, I'm establishing something in you. Because I want to go somewhere here in a second. And uh, you, I want you to go with me. Yeah. Is this helping at all? It, honestly, it'll free you from you, dude. That's what the gospel does. It frees us from us so that we can just be free. You know what it would look like if, the, if we didn't worry? You know what it would look like if we didn't fear? Dude, we would be free. Because worry and fear come from us. And the gospel frees us from us. This makes a lot of sense what I'm sharing with you right now. All right? I got thumbs up? Yay. Moms? Yeah, all right. Good. Does anybody know who Patricia King is? Okay. She's an amazing woman of God. Despite rumors or what you may hear, I spend time with her. She's like a mom to me. She's incredible. I can't even... She's amazing. She loves people like... She has... She's just amazing. All the way around, man. She just is. I didn't know her. Um, I was working full time. And I was working at an ice plant. It was my last job that I had. I lost two jobs for the gospel. Not, not because I was mean and said, well, I quit. Or, or I tried to rub anything in anybody's face. But when you walk out the gospel in love, in love, and supernatural things start happening in your life, Christians around you are very intimidated. 
and very, very, very. I'm not saying that you do your job and you're praying for so many people that you let your job slack. See, that's twisted. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking that you do your job because you're so heavenly minded that you're earthly amazing. And that you're doing your job above and beyond what's expected of you and they can't point the finger at you for a slacking on your job. The only thing they can point the finger at you about is there are supernatural things in your life that are happening that make me very uncomfortable. And if you get canned because of that, it's commendable before God. But if you get canned because you're praying for people and you just believe that God's called you to pray for people and you're letting your job slack, that's not what the gospel says. You do your job as unto the Lord. And not for man. That means I'm not working for the mean boss. I'm working for Jesus. I have so, so many different things because of that. I could tell you. But there's, so, there's so many testimonies. I need to stay focused here. Because there's so much stuff. I've worked for atheists. And God has blasted them, man. Because, not because I sit there and debate. I'm done with debate, dude. I'm finished. I won't debate with you. No. Uh-uh. I have people tell me, well, I don't believe in healing. Well, just good. Just stand still. I don't, I don't want that. I don't need that stuff, man. I don't. I just don't. That guy today in the gym that we prayed for, uh, prayed for the one girl, I watched them congregate at the desk and were, were mocking me and kind of looking over. God, God tells me about what people are saying. and Sometimes I hear exactly what they're saying from way far away, and which is good. And he won't do that to you if you use it for advice. But if he shows you that, it's not so that you can... He's, he, I learned it through my family where God started to share with me. Um, my family would mock, not so much my wife, but immediate family. Just not, not my, well, yeah, mother-in-law, father-in-law, all that stuff. And God would tell me exactly what they're saying. And he would say, does it bother you? I'd say, no, Dad. I love them. And he would say, okay. And he'd tell me more. Why? Not everything, God tells you secrets, not everything you're supposed to spout out. Sometimes He shares secrets about people. Not so you can, can, not so you, there's a time and a place for everything. So you need to be careful and guard yourself with how you let it all roll. Yeah. Yeah. Who here has not ever heard God? Be honest. Raise your hand. (laughs) Come on. Look, if you lie, you fry. Put your hand up. Okay, all right. I'm being honest. It's the word. <laughs> All liars have their place in the lake. Yeah. I promise you that if you hang this weekend, you will. I promise. Okay, because you're already hearing from God. You just don't know you are. I'm just telling you, you will. It's real simple. God doesn't speak. Todd, I have something to say to you. Take your shoes off for this place is holy. <laughs> There's times when it's been like that, but that's not... Sometimes we think there's this big, huge, booming voice that's going to come, but it's real soft. It's, sometimes it's just, just real gentle whisper. It's good. Mm. I've opened up a bunch of stuff. I need to make sure I, I finish it. Yeah. Okay. Let me go back to the Patricia thing. So I'm working at the ice plant and I am getting to pray for people. I'm seeing between 10 and 30 people healed on my job every day. Like I'm delivering ice to ice boxes. You know, I would get it off the truck, take it to the ice box, deliver it in the ice box, pray for people, get back in my truck, go to my next thing. And I would have a field day, man. I'm like, ah, just great. The guys at my job are very intimidated, very uncomfortable with me. I go to their stop sometimes and... When they're not there to do that part of their route, I go to their route and they'd hate it because people would get healed at their route. And then when they'd go back to work, they'd say, where's that guy that prays for people? And they weren't Christians. My, the other, the other drivers. So they were really weirded out by me. But I always loved them. I never came at them and were mean to them. I always loved them, no matter what. So, God told me to put two weeks notice in because I went and got my real estate license and, and, Told me to put a two-week notice into my ice job. It's the first job I've ever put two weeks in. I had 30 jobs before Christ came into my life. I quit or got fired. I was a drug addict for 22 years, so it was really bad. So I put two weeks in. I'm going to start real estate on Monday morning. Um, God tells me, I want you to go to this conference. And I'm like arguing with God because I didn't want to go to a conference. Because like I'm learning Him in the secret place. I'm learning about Him, learning from the Bible. Like 
Oh, I love it. I love conferences, but there are so many people that go from conference to conference to conference that the church has become constipated. Yeah. Because we need to release what we've been taught. That's right. Instead of staying bound up. I, I love conferences, but if you're just going to get filled up or hear another word and you're not releasing or acting on anything you've been taught, it's twisted and it ought not be. You've got to act on what you're being taught because when you act on it, you're, you're able to receive more. But in the kingdom, you never get more unless you give it away. So I'm not mad that you came. I'm happy that you are because you're going to be forced to give it away. I'm not coming tomorrow, bro. No, please do this. It'll help you. I promise. So I go to this conference. He's like, there's a lady in there named Patricia King. She has a word for you. So I don't need another word, God. I'm actually in that place where I'm, I know it's God, but I, I'm like, I am so okay with learning from my dad. I love teachers. Don't get me wrong. Don't hear me wrong. I was at that place in my life where revelation's coming and learning and I'm walking it out and he's teaching me and I'm like, oh, like a little kid. That's where I'm at. So I go and never met Patricia before and Trish is there, and it's the glory school, which is different. And I'm listening to the teaching and stuff, and it's all biblical, because I'm a word guy. I want to see it in my word. Don't you dare take what I say for this. You, you take this thing into the secret place and say, Papa, reveal it to me. Because I've shared a lot of scripture in what I'm sharing with you. I just haven't taken you into the book yet. But I have, because my life is the, becoming the book. <laughs> So Patricia is in the midst of this thing, and I've never met her, and she goes, Todd, Todd White, where are you? And she's like, she knows my name. <laughs> weird, right? <laughs> to me, it's weird because I've, I've heard prophecies and prophets and stuff, and I love it, and I know it's true because I'm learning how to prophesy. I'm, I'm, it's growing in me, and it grows as you massage it. It just does. She calls me out. She says, the Lord says you're a new breed. And she started to share my heart and what God's been teaching me in the secret place. And it's rocking me. And like I'm on my back, like fully getting rocked by God. Can't stand up. It's not mess nasty. <laughs> was anybody there? Did anybody see? Were you, was anybody there? There are people I've, I've said, dude, I was there that time. Patricia called you out. That was funny, man. <laughs> because I was just a real mess. I was undone, right? So she goes... She, she prophesied over me and she, and she stops and she's just standing there like this and, and all of a sudden people started getting up all over the congregation and throwing money on my chest. No one was, in, no one was told, let's sow into Todd, let's like take an offering. Everybody spontaneously got up and started to do this. Well, I'm out not knowing what's going on and I come to and I looked and I went, ah, I lost it again, right? <laughs> I did. It's, I'm a mess. So they put all this stuff into a bag and stuff. And Patricia said, I want to have dinner with Todd tonight. Like, who am I? You know what I mean? Who am I that the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name? That's good. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Who am I? I'm a son. I'm a son. No. I'm my beloved and he is mine. Uh, you know that song? Did you ever hear that? Sorry. So I go and meet with Patricia and I tell her I'm starting real estate on Monday morning. She goes, no, you're not. I said, yeah, I am. I already had the cards made and everything. Got a thousand cards. I really did. My wife is not at the conference, so she didn't see what happened. She's at home because I went to this last night, like this is the last night of the conference. And so she said, no. She said, we want you and your wife to come down to Arizona to possibly think about joining our XP team and you can help to lead evangelism and power evangelism. And I go, well, but I'm starting real estate on Monday. So <laughs> I'm so, I'm, I'm so teaching you right here. Very important because you need to stop pressing in to get into ministry. I'm protecting your heart. I'm not telling you that you don't belong there. I'm telling you, don't force your way in. Is this making sense? Yes. People don't like to hear this yes. stuff, but I, tough. It. Yeah. It'll, it'll save you from you. 
It'll save you from a wrecking ball. Man, God wants you to be the best you that He created you to be. Shine in your workplace. Be a light so people see you and they want what you have. And when God sees fit, you won't even see it coming. It'll just bang, it'll overtake you. So she's like, we want you to come down. And I said, well, I'll have to talk to my wife because, you know, I don't know. But we'll fly down and, and I think she'll be okay with that. So I went home that night, woke my wife up, 1.30 in the morning. Honey, you need to get up. You've got to watch this video. She goes, honey, it's 1.30 in the morning. We have church tomorrow morning and we've got to get up early. I said, I know, but you've got to watch the video. So she comes out, you know, and I didn't put the bag of money out. I put it in the kitchen. She comes out. We're living in a single wide trailer, 1978, that we're just finally to come out on, on top of our debt so that we're not in debt. I, I horribly destroyed our family, just horribly, financially, just really bad. So we're finally getting out of debt, you know. We have holes in the floors, broken windows, blankets on the windows. Just get the scene. It's pretty bad. I want to give my wife a house, but I'm not going to pray about having one. I'm not going to pray, God, give me a house. I, that's not how he's taught me. He's taught me, don't pray about the things you need. Seek me with everything you are. And those things will follow you. That's a really, really, really good word. I promise you. We're going to go somewhere and we're going to talk about it a little bit in a second here. It's really good. Oh, it's so good. He knows your needs. He's like God and stuff. You don't got to like remind him. Hey God, remember... He knows, right? You all right? Okay. So she watches the video and she looks at me without saying anything. She goes, are we moving? And she's bawling. And I went in the kitchen and I put the money out in front of her. And she lost it, right? She dumps it out and I have her count it. You need to count it because I'm not good at counting stuff. So she counts it. She's crying the whole time. It was $6,100. Now watch. There was one bill that we couldn't pay off. It was a credit card that I had ripped us off and charged taking cash out for drugs. It was $6,000. God paid off that debt in four minutes. We took all that money and applied it to be a very good steward of what God does in your life. Because He wants you to be debt free. He does. Sometimes we get finances and we might not apply it to what we need to. I won't go there right now, but it's a good word. It really is. So we paid off a credit card. So Jackie and I, my wife and I, we fly down. We go down there and it's amazing. Very hot, but very amazing. Phoenix is very hot in July, in May, March, April. It's just hot. All year long, it's hot. So we're down there and uh, I think it was, it was March. We're down there in March. We go and look at these houses and they're like, one-fifth of the price, the housing market down there. We went into this million-dollar house, and they want 197000 for this thing. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. This is amazing. My wife goes, this is the one. I said, okay. If we were to move there, that's the one. And now watch. Patricia's ministry is amazing. It's family. Everybody's family. It's like everybody cares and sincerely bends over backwards for everybody. It's called love. Each considers others better than themselves. It's amazing. She has culture in her family. So everything is a dream. So my wife is going to be a stay-at-home mom. She's going to be able to homeschool the kids, which is my heart, because that's what we want. And I'm going to be an itinerant speaker. And so I'm like, Patricia said, you need to really pray about this. because This is a big decision. I said, okay, all right, we will. So we went home and I'm in a fasting prayer place because now I, I know that I'm not supposed to start my job on Monday because I have things that I need to do. There are things. So I call the people and tell them, no, give me another two weeks. I need to sort some stuff out and, and we can start then. And I need to hear from God. And the place I was going to work for was a Christian man who loved God. And so I'm a week and a half into my prayer closet just seeking him. God, he said, you're not moving. So now I've got to tell my wife. Because, see, we live in the trailer. And she's working at a job. She's been there for a long time. And she's always been the breadwinner. She's always been the one, you know? So then all of a sudden, like, I go, and hey, honey, we're not supposed to move. That didn't go over really well. Not because she was mad, because she was sad. 
because it was like the carpet just got ripped out from under her. Right? Never, ever put expectations on anything. See, if I put expectations on you, I give you the right to let me down. If I put expectations on somebody, I give them the right to be my potter. But if I'm in love with God and all I owe them is the love of God, I'm not expecting anything from them. I want to give to them. That's another good one, too. It'll, it'll free you from you. It will. Is anybody starting to get the picture of freeing you from you, this gospel? It does. It's a totally non-selfish thing. It's good. So my wife was like, okay. Um, I called Patricia. She said, you're hearing from God, Todd. She goes, I'm very proud of you. This is a very big decision. You know, and, but everything looks like it's the dream. See, I believe that Elijah and Elisha, when Elijah told Elisha that if you see me when I'm taken up, you know, you can have what you asked for. I believe that the chariot came down. I believe that that was a distraction. I believe the distraction was the chariot of fire that came down in between. And I believe that the scripture said he was taken up in the whirlwind. Yes, he could have looked at the chariot, but he just wasn't ready for what he asked for. Because it says he was taken up in a whirlwind, not the chariot. So I believe that some things come and they look so good and everything lines up. It looks like a dream come true. But is it what God's saying? Does that make sense at all? So I tell my wife that a month later, I'm in full-time ministry with a guy named Dan. And I'm receiving a paycheck. And the paycheck is a certain amount. It's not a lot, but my wife works at a place. She works at a Comfort Inn. She's been there for 16 years. She's a manager there. She makes good money. Um, And so we're able to make ends meet. We're okay. You know, we're still paying off her debt and stuff. <clears throat> I, I had said in my heart, if this certain amount comes to this, if it comes to this point, once we get to that point, we're just going to go ahead and start to build on her property. So it was so crazy. After a month, after I established that amount in my heart, I didn't say, God, I want this amount. I just set an amount in my heart. It was weird. It was neat. So a month later, it comes to that exact amount to the T, to the dollar. So we tear down the trailer, man. And we're like building the house. So my wife is at work. She's working full time. We're um, in ministry, full time ministry. We decide to build the house. We build the house. Now in February of this year past, we decided to stop any kind of financial flow of coming in as a guaranteed income. And we're going to completely depend upon God for my side of like income. Like it's just neat. Different. Very Awesome. Crazy. Because I never say I need a certain amount to come anywhere. I never put expectations on people. I just don't, man. Just trust my papa. So we're building the house. Two weeks before we move into our house, I'm with CBN. I'm in Las Vegas. We're doing a film shoot. We're filming with the 700 Club, filming people getting healed in a place that people say is a sin city and God can't move there. Well, we should shine brighter in places like that. So we were having a fun time. But first day my wife calls me. She says, honey, I just wanted to tell you something. She goes... I'm not having a very good day. We're two weeks before we move in. She said, they fired me this morning. I said, why? She said, they said, just get your stuff and leave. We don't need you anymore. Didn't tell her anything else. Sixteen and a half years she worked for them. She made good money. We're two weeks before we move into our home with no guaranteed income. My response is, oh, honey, this is going to be amazing. Her response is, what are you talking about? I said, look, did God put me into this thing? Did God put us into this thing? I said, me, and then I said, us. She said, yes. I said, what have we always learned to depend upon God? See, what Satan's trying to do is force us into a position to get worried. But what he doesn't understand is that every time he pokes you, he pushes you closer or further away from God. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so I said, is there anything that convicts you in your heart at all about doing less than your job is required of you every time you've been at work? She said, absolutely not. I've always done more than was asked. I said, it's who God created you to be. I said, it's time for you to take a rest. I said, we're going to be totally blessed. Honey, I got to go. We're getting ready to go out on a camera shoot right now. I love you so much. I'll call you in a little while. 
So now my wife is a stay-at-home mom. We build our house. My kid's homeschooled. She's home with our three-year-old. She gets to be a mom to our kids. I am traveling and preaching the gospel. I get to share and equip the church to rise up and be the church, not just go, but to be the church. Because these four walls are where we're supposed to congregate to be equipped to go. You're supposed to have places where you can fellowship. Don't forsake the assembling together of people. The saints are supposed to assemble together. It's supposed to be a party. We're supposed to be excited about this thing. We're supposed to be equipped to go and then be the church. So God said, Todd, I'm raising you up to kick people out of the boat. (laughs) Yay. Come on. Yay. So now our whole life is fully dependent upon him. If he doesn't show up, we're finished. Why? Because I couldn't be a husband to my, to my wife if God didn't show up in my life. I couldn't be a father to my kids and I definitely couldn't afford to have a house at all. So we're in a full... De- I'm not telling you to quit your job. I'm telling you, do your job as under the Lord. And He'll make sure that you're alright. You okay? Alright, let me do something real quick and then we'll be done. Haven't you done enough, brother? <laughs> You've been up there for four hours, man. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Who here is able to come? What time start tomorrow? Ten o'clock. Who here is going to be able to be here tomorrow? Seven of you. <laughs> Ten o'clock. Ten and six. Who here can come tomorrow night too? I want to encourage you to come because I. Because this message that I'm preaching is going to build. And we're just going to go and it's going to build. But I'm going to establish just something foundational that I've been teaching about the whole night. Okay? All right. Matthew 6. Woo! Yeah. Okay, let's go to 19. 56, 19. It says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Okay. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Keep in mind that we've separated it because we've written the Bible this way. But in the Bible, it was a letter. Right? Okay. So it's a solid thing. There's no breaks. It's just solid. It talks about no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other. Or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. He's talking about the eye of the body. He's talking about being a lamp. He's talking about being healthy, your eye being healthy. See, in the Gospels, there is no plan B. There is only plan A. See, there's not, yes, I know that's what it says, but for now, that's not allowed. See, plan A means that what God says goes, you have to have the perspective, a kingdom mindset, a kingdom sight. Your vision has to see things His way. If you don't see things the way that God says that they are, what happens is you're double-minded, and when you pray, you won't receive anything. So single eye means that I have a one-track mind, gospel, gospel-track mind. A single eye means that I'm seeing things from heaven's perspective. I'm seeing things from the king's point of view. Repent means re-look at things from the penthouse or the top floor. Bill Johnson explained it perfectly. Re-looking at things from God's perspective. Repent, changing the way you think. Doing a 180%, doing a 180% turnaround. Looking at things from his perspective towards here. So repent means taking on the mindset or the eyes of God to where you're thinking and seeing things like he does. So, he's saying, re-look at things from his point of view. See, in the world, there's money, and what happens is when 
Right now, the economy is not doing too well. But people that are focused on kingdom are doing very well. Yes. Why? Because in this time and hour, if you're not seeking the kingdom, what you have will be shaken. A promise. You're receiving something in Hebrews 13 that says that's unshakable. His kingdom's unshakable, but everything will be shaken. And right now, you're at a time and season, an hour, where everything outside of that is being shaken completely. That means that if you're 80%, if your business is 80% for God, 20% for you, you will find that 20% turning to 25, 25, 30, 35, 40. Before you know it, your business is down the tubes because it wasn't kingdom. But if you're in business from Him, all of a sudden everything is good because you're living from God, not for Him. But you're a blessing, so He wants to bless that. Your perspective is everything in this time and hour. God wants 100% surrendered life. See, in the Bible it says that I wish that you were either hot or cold. See, when you're cold, you are like me, freezing out there. All of a sudden, God went, bink, flicked you like a light switch, and now you're hot because there is no in-between. See, I, I'm going to be on fire for something. It's either going to be the demonic or God. There is no in-between. The problem is, is we think for others there is, and there's not. See, I'm, uh, people say you have an addictive personality. I, you, all of us are meant to be addicted to Jesus. All of us are meant to be addicted to the Holy Spirit. Addicted to relationship to where we're consumed by Him. To where we become what it looks like to be consumed. So cold, you can turn hot immediately. Hot in the Bible doesn't just mean I'm on fire for the Lord. Hot means that every part of my life is surrendered for God. And you burn brighter because you can't get enough. Whoa. You can't get enough of him. So hot, you burn brighter. Cold, you switch from here to here. Lukewarm. See, I understand hot and I understand cold. Lukewarm, I don't understand because they've at least have a God incorporated into their life. So, well, Todd, that's easy. When you're lukewarm, you're a damage to the world around you. There is... No such thing as passive Christianity. It's the devil's playground. (laughs) 25 says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? See, in the garden... When man fell, Bible's trashed. It's good. I can still read it. In verse 14 in Genesis, in Genesis 3, it says, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle. More than every beast of the field on your belly you shall go and eat dust all the days of your life. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you will, and you, you shall bruise his heel. Then he says, and I'll put, and I will greatly multiply your sorrow to the woman and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Do you know I know people that have, have children without any pain in childbirth? I know a person that's delivered 14 children with no pain in childbirth. It's under the curse. We need a revelation of that. Women do, because I don't, you know. mm. (laughs) But that's crazy, right? I know people personally that have had that happen. I mean, I wasn't there, but, but I know accurate accounts, like, That's crazy. Then he said to Adam, because you've heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree, of which I commanded you, saying, you shall eat of it, you shall not eat of it. I want to tell you this. A lot of people say, you know, well, Eve was tempted, but Adam was right there. That's not what the Bible teaches. And I'm not beating up women. But I want to share to you, there's a valuable principle in here. A lot of times we take what someone else's word for it is instead of what God said. And he said, because you heeded her voice and not mine. You hearing that? So I'm up here telling you and sharing that. That means don't just take my voice for it, my word for it. Go into this Bible and know him. 
so that he can reveal it to you. I'm not beating up women. Don't hear me wrong. I love everybody. I'm telling you that if we listen to the voice of a pastor and never look in our word, what happens is we've heeded the voice of one without heeding the voice of him. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, but thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat of the herb of the field, and in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. The dust you are, and to the dust you shall return. And here in Matthew 6, he's talking about not worrying. See, when we, when man fell in the garden, we took on the nature of survival. So now what happens is there's a way that seems right to a man and the way that seems right to a man is to worry and to fret and to freak out about what we don't have and to act, and to act out of lack. When God talks about serving God or money, you can't serve both. It's very important that when you serve God with everything you are, money will follow because you're serving Him. But when we worry, we're, we're acting out of lack. And what happens is our conscience, it gets wrecked and gets tormented. And Satan pounds you because isn't your life more important than food and the body more than clothing? So survivalism needs to be broken off so that we can have a dependent relationship on our papa. Knowing that he's going to supply everything for us. Don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor your body about what you'll put on. Is not life more than clothing and the bo- or life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. Check this out. That word Gentile in the new, I think it's the new international version, is pagan. Okay. Now, here's what it says. It says, Therefore, don't worry about what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear. For after all these things, the pagans seek. When you practice worry as a lifestyle and it dominates you to the point where that's all that you can think about, you're acting like a pagan. You're practicing paganism. I'm not saying we don't need stuff. I understand that we do. I'm telling you that when that consumes you and that becomes your focus, your focus is now practicing paganism. It's really the word of God. When you practice worry, you practice paganism. You know, there are prosperity teachings that are out there that will teach you that you've got to remind God about what you need. You know, hey, brother, you've got to remind God. You've got to, you've got to remind God about what you need. I mean, he wants you... Ugh. I just disagree with a lot of the stuff that I'm hearing because a lot of it's self-centered and selfish and focused on self. Listen to me. You can be born again and be way more selfish than you are outside once you've come inside this thing. Because you've been taught that coming into Christianity is a big, huge, bless me club. That I'm here and I'm going to be blessed, brother. Come on, if you come in thinking you're going to be blessed, when you're not blessed, you don't stay in. You get mad and say, I've been there, done that, didn't work for me. God's not Jehovah Jireh. He's not a provider. He didn't provide for me. He doesn't even care about me. Because you came in in selfishness and the nature of selfishness wasn't grafted out due to righteousness that has come in and consumed you. But selfishness has been your life and all of a sudden it's bigger now that you've come into the kingdom. So it says this, it says... After all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows all the things that you need. God knows everything you need. You don't have to remind Him. He knows what you need. He's God. (laughs) Anybody ever hear Jake Hamilton? You are a good, good daddy. Isn't that awesome? That's an awesome song, right? 
He is. He rejoices over me. You are a good, good daddy. Mm. He knows what you need. He knows it. Now watch. Here's the key to crushing worry in your life. To having worry never have a grip on you again. Would you like that? Because the number one thing is worry. We worry about our past. We're going to hit that thing sometime this weekend too. Because God's given me, I told, I told this amazing man, how God has given me a revelation of what it means to never have your past touch you. To never even hear the voices anymore. To have every voice silenced so that you don't even hear it. <laughs> we teach people that you have to go through years and years and years of stuff for the voices to stop. I want to tell you that it's a one-step program. Look, you cannot stand there and resist the devil enough for him to shut up. I resist you, devil. I command you, get behind me. One, two, three. That's how it is. We have to cast down every stronghold with truth. So when he touches you, you just proclaim who you are. You don't sit there and rebuke him. See, it's a one-step program. Therefore, submit to God. And the devil's resisted. <laughs> okay, let me get back here. But, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things. What things? The things you worried about. The things you stressed out about. The things you freaked out about because you didn't have, because you were operating out of lack. Do we really believe that God's Jehovah Jireh? Do we believe that God is able to provide for you? And why do we worry? Well, because you've got to look out for yourself. Wrong. Looking out for yourself is looking out for selfishness and that'll never do it. You look out for number one. He's number one. So in everything you do, you submit to His rule. How do we avoid worry? Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Yeah, but how? Everything that you are is going to exist out of righteousness. Everything that you need is going to come to you out of kingdom. Kingdom is the lordship and the dominion of Jesus in every aspect, in every area of your life, minus none. Righteousness is the nature and characteristics of God coming down, possessing a man, making me right with him so the enemy has nothing on me and the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Glory. God told me in, when I was in Teen Challenge, He said, I'm stamping a scripture on your forehead. It's going to be Matthew 6.33 and you're going to live by this every day of your life. He told me that in my first two months of, of meeting Him. And that's how we live. And that's how we don't worry. That's how I don't stress out about stuff, man. I'm not telling you that like stuff doesn't come to try to get you worked up. I'm telling you that focus has to be coming back to kingdom and righteousness in everything you do because Satan will... He'll keep pounding you and keep pounding you because he really doesn't believe that you believe the words that you confess. He believes it's just a confession and not an action. That feels good. This, this, some of this is new stuff. I'm like, we're recording it. I'm going to want to hear it. So. <laughs> That's how this thing works, man. God, I just opened my mouth and God, please fill it because I've been here for a long time already, man. Yeah. Does this make sense? Yeah. Okay.